Hey everybody, that was awful. My name is Aaron Cano and welcome to Movie Battleground. Uh, we oh, have to yeah, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, we are, I've done worse, so. Um, we are bringing you guys the first match of the second round of the tournament. We had, uh, technically speaking, there were nine matches in the first round of the tournament, uh, the eight rap matches and then the qualification match between myself and Clark. Uh, we started off with 17 players. We are down currently to eight players left, and today we have two of those players facing off against each other to see who moves on to the next round. And this is an interesting combination of players because both of these guys play have both played a big part in movie battleground up until this point and both players have uh, a big part in their own league full metal trivia we're going to go ahead and start with the first player we're introducing today coming in with a record of three wins one defeat and one knockout alex warden alex how are you doing i'm doing good i'm actually fighting off a cold at the moment but between the miracles of medicine and bed rest i I'm doing okay today. This is, as you said, it's going to be a very interesting match. Chance and I, we've had our battles in the past in various leagues and trivia. We've never, however, faced off in Battleground, so this is definitely going to be an interesting fight. It's also the second tournament going on in Worldwide Movie Games where we have to play in the second round when this could potentially be a championship match by just sheer luck of the draw. But hey, we'll roll with the punches. It's going to be a fun fight. We've got some fun questions. I know we both have some fun ideas. This is just going to be a show, and whoever comes out on top on this one is definitely going to earn their keep as a top-ranked player in this game. It's going to be a good fight. Most definitely, and we already said it, but his opponent coming in with a record of three wins, two defeats, and one knockout, Chance Ellison. Chance, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Like Alex said, uh, this is the second term I've had to face him in round two. It's something, you know, something fishy going on in World Rugby Games. I don't know what's yes, going on. I, I don't know what's happening. Again, guys. <laughs> You're trying to systematically take us little metal guys out, but whatever. Uh, yeah, I'm back for round two of the Movie Battleground tournament. And uh, yeah, I know I know Alex is a fighter. He's very good. I know it's going to be a great fight. And uh, plus, I'm at, it's actually, I'm not fighting at seven in the morning this time. So I'm much more, much more awake, much more into it, and I'm ready to go. I'm sure that definitely helps not waking up and having to fight right away. Um, all right, so with that, let's go ahead and just give a quick explanation of the rules for people who uh, may not remember or may not have seen a match before. The way that this works is we're going to have four uh, main fights. The players have already had their questions given to them. They've already picked and had their answers approved, and both players are aware of who, what, who, who the other person has answered for their questions. There's a way easier way to say that sentence that I did not use. Um, the way it's going to work is each round is five minutes. Both players have a minute uh, extension that they can use on one round during the match. If they want to use that extension, they just tell me before the opening arguments start, and it'll the time will be added on. If both players choose to use it during the same round, we can do that and extend one round out to seven minutes. The players are not obligated to use their uh, one-minute extension, but the option is there if they have a question that they're extra passionate about and want to talk about for longer. Um... If the main part of the game ends with a score of 3-1 to one or 2-2, two to two, we'll move on to the speed round in which they will have uh, a time period of 30 seconds and 15 seconds to answer uh, questions that are given to them in the moment. And uh, from there, we'll figure out who the winner is. Uh, one player has to score four points in order to win, so if the main game ends with it, main game ends with a score of 4-0, to zero, that is a knockout victory for the winning competitor. Um, with the second round of the tournament, we're also introducing something new. Previously, we had, it's not a big change, but previously we had just had the higher ranked competitor go first, and then we would just alternate back and forth between the two competitors. However, starting with this match, uh, the higher ranked competitor of the two is actually going to get the choice of what round they would want to go first on. So we're going to jump over to Alex now, who is uh, based off the questions, it pick, has picked the two rounds that he wants to go first on, and then those other two rounds, Chance will go first on. So, Alex, what two rounds did you want to go first on? I'm going to go first on round number one and round number four. Okay, which means Chance is going to go first on rounds two and three. And with that, that is all the rules explained for the mo uh, explained. Do the competitors have any questions? Nope. Let's do this. Nope. All right. 
And so with that, we're going to go ahead and get into the first question. Um, so Dwayne Johnson obviously just came off of a huge box office success with Jumanji. He has another potential one coming up with, uh, I believe it's Rampage's first, and then he has Skyscraper later in the year. So this dude is just making blockbuster after blockbuster. Um, but the one that I think a lot of people are excited for is he has a Fast and Furious spinoff film with him and Jason Statham's character from that franchise. I believe the name is Deckard Shaw is the character's name. Yeah. Um, and those are the two. They're going to have their own spinoff film based off of the chemistry that the two showed in uh, Fast 7 and Fast 8. So we decided to ask the question just because The Rock is The Rock. Um, we already did a question like this once with pitch Kevin Hart and The Rock, but now we're asking pitch the Dwayne Johnson, Jason Statham, Fast and Furious spinoff. Now, the only criteria that I they gave, they had to answer was they had to pick a director and they had to pick two co-stars to appear in the movie ahead of time. Once they gave those answers and once they were different from each other, from there they have free reign to pitch whatever movie they would like. So, Alex, you have chosen to go first on this one. Go ahead and give your right. opening arguments. Obviously, these will be a little longer than normal open our arguments because you are trying to pitch something to me. So go ahead and begin. All right. So the thing is, when I think of the Fast and Furious franchise, I think of a series that has both grown in scope and absurdity since it's begun. What started off as a movie about street racers doing illegal activities and crime has jumped into the point where it's about secret shadow government agencies and conspiracies and using cars to fight a fucking nuclear submarine. Like, <laughs> you, you see the 15 year gap of these movies and where did this come from? But it's a natural progression if you watch them. So I wanna keep that kind of spirit going in the Fast and the Furious spinoff between Hobbs and Deckard Shaw, which I would like to call Hard Bottom. And there's a reason I call it that. It's going to be directed, oh it's directed by David Leitch, who had brought us, was the co-director of John Wick, the director of last year's kind of sleeper hit Atomic One, and the upcoming Deadpool 2. So he's a man who can balance both action and comedic timing. Your known co-stars for this film will be returning from her cameo appearance in Fast and Furious 8, Helen Mirren as Magdalene Shaw, who is both who in this film we learn is not only Deckard Shaw's mother and an arms dealer, she's also actually a former MI6 head of staff in Prague. And you also see the boss of Kev of The Rock's character, Luke Hobbs, Kevin Hart who's known as Mr. Biggs, who's the new head of the DSS, who doesn't like Hobbs' methods and wants him to stick to a desk job. They end up, both in both Haw Shaw, who's now on the side of good, once again working for the UK Special Forces, and Hobbs with DSS, end up investigating the same villain and a secret shadowy corporation called New Tesla, headed by a new supervillain named Milan Husk, played by Mads Mikkelsen, who has a plot to both smuggle drugs through the Atlantic and destroy the world with a satellite at the same time. And we just let the absurdity flow. We have action, we have comedy, we've got maybe a little romance in there, which I'll get into. And ultimately you just have a really fun, ridiculous movie that embraces how absurd this franchise has gotten in action and spectacle from starting off as being about street racers. Okay, good opening argument. And Chance, we're gonna go ahead and bounce over to you. All right, so uh, the working title of my movie right now is Hobbs and Shaw, Agents of Strike, which, uh, which I'm going to be bringing up Strike a lot. Strike stands for Strategic Tactical Recon International Knowledge Enforcement. Uh, it's directed by uh, David Leach's John Wick buddy, Chad Stahelski, who, of course, directed John Wick 2 last year. And uh, the plot pretty much goes like this. So the movie starts out where Brown were fast, eight, and Hobbs taking time off from the DSS. Or, well, he's done with the DSS, spending time with his daughter. Uh, he gets he keeps getting approached to join this new uh, covert outfit called Strike, but he keeps declining. And then one day he's attacked at his daughter's dance recital by assassins, all in bold, by the way. Uh, he fights them off, but then he's approached by a returning Mr. Nobody, played once again by Kurt Russell. He says that they found him because they there's a hack, there's a hack in the system, there's a, a cyber terrorist called. Uh, he's calling himself a supremacist, and he's pretty much leaking a bunch of government secrets, and they need to stop him, and in order to do that, he needs to join this new covert off-book unit called Strike, but they've, they've been asking to join. 
So he does it. And along for the ride is also, of course, Deckard Shaw, who ever since the events of Fast 8, has been carrying out undercover, sec- top secret, off-book government, government missions. Uh, so along with them, you get a brand new crew. You got uh, uh, up-and-coming agent Eliza, played by Aza Gonzalez from Baby Driver. Uh, you have a sharpshooter named Vic, played by Academy Award winner Marshala Ali. You have tech genius Ahmad, played by Bina Masood. The guy is going to be Aladdin in the Disney Live Action Remake. And ace pilot and driver Samuel, played by Jiang Wang. So the movie is basically them trying to track down the supremacist guy and find out who he is. And then you get to the end of the first act and you realize that the supremacist is a guy named David Williams, played by Sterling K. Brown of This Is Us, who is an amazing actor. And who's actually Hobbs original partner, who he thought was dead for the past 10 years. Then when you come to superiors, you find out that he was actually, uh, he was sent on a top secret covert mission in, uh, I believe it was Afga- yeah, Afghanistan. And, but a mission was botched. They couldn't save him. So they just left him for dead. He was kidnapped and tortured for years. And now he is out to screw the government who screwed him. And movies and movie at that point is Hobbs questioning himself, his allegiances, everything he's ever known, trying to redeem his friend, and also him, Shaw, and the rest of Strike trying to stop William Ford. He completely shatters life as we know it. That's my pitch. All right, guys, uh, definitely some fun, interesting pitches there with some great casts involved. You guys are going to have five minutes on the clock to debate back and forth. Uh, the debates here can include anything from pumping up your movie to talking about you know extra plot points to right. carrying down the other movie whatever you guys prefer to use five minutes on the clock when one of you begins speaking all right well since chance actually mostly fleshed out the plot of his movie i kind of barely scratched the surface the actual plot of my movie will involve a secret government uh, anti-government agency called new tesla headed by the villain milan husk who are funding themselves by running drugs through a secret underwater tunnel that goes between the shores of Columbia and Miami, Florida, during through which they drive electric cars. Now, it takes place first in Prague, which is where we meet up with Shaw and his mother running their secret operations, when they find out that money from the villains they're fighting is coming from New Tesla. The Rock investigate is investigating them in Miami, and of course the two shall meet in Columbia and start their fight there. They'll have the fight in the underwater tunnel where they're driving supercars, which collapses. And they're like, this is some Dominic Toretto shit. Why are we doing this? And then all, when they get back to Miami, which is where their trail leads off, they'll meet up with a retur- another returning character, Monica Fuentes, played by Ava Mendez, who gets Ava them on Mendes the trail. Bring Ava Mendez back. She okay, I'm going to bring her. That's fine. Might as well bring her back, too. And then eventually it'll lead to the fact that Husk's base of operations is actually beneath Cape Canaveral, Florida, where it turns out he's been secretly running silent run missile tests to get himself up into space to take control of a super weapon that can use kinetic bombardment in order to destroy various cities across the world, holding them for ransom. The first target of which is Miami, Florida, which we find out is Hobbs' hometown. So Hobbs has a little bit of a personal vendetta. The Shaw family has a bit of a personal vendetta, and Hobbs' boss, Mr. Biggs, does not want to let him go without any supervision. So we see the four of them go up into space to start their mission on the ISS, where we meet another returning character from another movie, Lev Antropov, played by Peter Stormare. Yes, this means that this movie, the Fast and the Furious franchise, and Armageddon all take place in the same Okay, no, no, okay, I'm, stop, I'm stopping you right there. I'm off the ridiculous ship. I'm stopping you right there. First of all, I'm using it. He, he ate up a lot of time right now, so I'm using an extension. Uh, second of all, do you do you hear the words that are coming out of your mouth like this? Okay, yeah. look, Fast and Furious. We have okay, chance, we have the main chance. series for this. Just so you're aware, I can't activate the extension just because we're already into the actual round itself. But what I'll do is I'll keep the clock pause for ten seconds, let you talk, and then I'll restart it. You guys are at two fifty one right now. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay, do you hear the words that are coming out of your mouth? Like, we had the main series. We had the regular Fast and Furious. Those are for our ridiculous shit. Like, with my, like let's try something different. Let's try, like, a sleek action spy thriller. Like, something, like, a little more grounded in reality. That's what I want to see with this Hob, with this Hobbs movie. And uh, on top of yours, you have Kevin Hart in your movie, which, look, I love yeah. Kevin Hart. But you throw Kevin, Hart, you throw Kevin Hart and Dwayne Johnson in the same movie, it's automatically going to become a Kevin Hart-Dwayne Johnson vehicle. It's going to take fo- a lot of focus away from Kevin Hart, yeah. from uh, Dwayne Johnson, from well, Hobbs and Shaw. So. 
here's the thing. The Kevin Hart screen time is only going to kind of be in the shadows. He's kind of just like popping out from behind objects or just like off to the side reading from a newspaper and then slinking his head down. He's kind of observing The Rock. He's not necessarily directly interacting with them unless absolutely necessary. Thing is, I'm listening to your pitch and I'm hearing your pitch. And while it does sound interesting, it would sound more interesting if this was The Expendables 3, which is kind of what the plot of your movie is, when you just replace... Oh, bullshit. It's, it kind of is when you factor in that this is basically the arc of Sylvester Stallone and Mel Gibson's characters in that movie, two former co-workers who are now at odds against each other and struggling who's the good in guy who's the bad guy. In all fairness, I did not see, Expend I did not see Expendables 3, but uh -uh. the thing, though. Like, it's just, like, first of all, you need the crew. Like, and something I like about the Fast and Furious is the fact that it has an international feel. Like, I got a whole mix of different cast members in my in my movie, which I think that's going to that's gonna be that's gonna greatly benefit the franchise. Like, that's what this franchise is about, essentially, aside from cars and craziness. It's about being, being international. Plus, this is a great for this is a great potential. This has potential for a great first entry in a great new franchise because the Fast and Furious look is lo losing steam. The movies are getting kind of worse. So we need to try to we need to try to salvage this somehow. So we need to try something completely different. Okay, and that's and, fair. Uh, well, personally though, good, if good. the thing is, again, you're kind of, this pitch here. You've got the international team. You've got the cast. It's kind of like new players coming in to mix against a bunch of old hats who know each other. Again, it's basically the plot of Expendables three. Whereas with my movie, you're focusing on Shaw and Hobbs. You're focusing on their friendship and their partnership that's still growing throughout this movie. Most of the movie would see just the two of them together clashing and interacting and fighting off thugs and whatnot. And then a final sequence that does see them go up into space based out of the ISS using a brand new supercar that can fly in space and is armed with missiles to fight this kinetic bombardment satellite that Husk himself is piloting while their friends are back on the ISS. Lev Antropov sacrifices himself to save the lives of Mrs. Shaw, of Miss Shaw and Mr. Biggs, while the other two are off fighting in the supercar. They stop the bad guy. They blow up the satellite. They save Miami, and when they get back to the okay, ISS, well, out, of out of curiosity, what's out of curiosity? What's what's the tone of your movie? The tone of the movie is, is played. It it's in the vein of something like a. It's in the vein of something like Atomic Blonde or Fast or Fate of the Furious, where, yeah, it's absurdist bullshit. What the fuck is going on in front of you? But the characters are playing it with 100% absolute sincerity. Not to mention... Okay, but, there, but there's, all, there's only so far you can push that. You need, you need to have something yeah. that's kind okay, of... Okay, and that is time. Like... That is going to be time on the main round. Alex, you went first for opening, so you're going to yeah. go first for closing. Well... To kind of zone in on a point that Chance was just bringing up there, with a director like David Leitch, who has proven with the original John Wick and Atomic Blonde and from everything we've seen from Deadpool 2, he can balance the absurdism of action comedy by having his actors play it completely 100% with sincerity. He's proven that in his previous films, and I think this would be another big step for him. Not to mention he's proven he's an act, a director who can balance the tone of both absurdity, action, and yet good dramatic storytelling with good plot telling. Not to mention with my movie, you're bringing in established characters and bringing them back into the franchise who previously would just use them as cameo fodder, such as Ava Mendez, introducing an actor like Mads Mikkelsen, who we know from his past work in both Casino Royale and Hannibal, can play a very convincing, menacing villain, bringing back the character of Lev Antropov, who nobody would expect it. It's kind of an out of the blue, what the fuck moment, but you kind of just have to roll with it. And the end of the movie, there's also a romance going on because the few scenes they get to spend together, you'd sense there's something going on between Miss Shaw and Mr. Biggs, the characters played by Helen Mirren and Kevin Hart. At the end, they actually do hook up and you get a little exchange between Statham and his mother care and Mirren, where Statham goes, You you hooked up with him? He's a little he's a little short, isn't he? And she just looks at him and goes, He's not short where it counts. And you get that kind of little bit of comedy going in and out of the film. But again, it's the actors who play it with 100% certainty and sincerity who let the absurdism fly, but make a really fun action blockbuster, which is what this franchise has become. You embrace that tone, you roll with it, and you've got a movie that people will go see based on the name recognition of the actors alone and walk out of thinking, yeah, that was the dumb popcorn movie I wanted, and I got that plus a little bit of fun. All right, and Chance, go for closing. <clears throat> okay, first of all, before I say anything, let me just clarification. You said uh, Helen Mirren and Kevin Hart are going to hook up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, first of all, we'll say this. On the, on the point he hit for Expendables 3, uh, Inside Out is also has a very similar premise to Osmosis Jones and the Pyramid's Head. But, but that premise, premise has been done before. It matters what you can bring new and what you can improve on. And this is improving on that kind of ish premise. Uh, you have 
I mean, yeah, yeah, Chad's the Hell's Key, the better of the at the helm, because you look at what Chad's Hell's Key with John Wick 2, and you look at David, what David Lee did with Tommy Blonde, though I did really like that movie. Uh, there's no question. John Wick 2 is way better. You have the great international cast. You have a brand new tone, a brand new feel, which is what this movie should be. I mean, if you're going to spin off these two characters, you want them to do something different. You want them to do something other than what we've seen before, which is ridiculous. Because this ridiculous, absurd crap. We want something a little more grand reality. We want something more sleek, something more stylish. Uh, and it's also a great... It could also be a great um, jumping off point for a brand new franchise star and these great characters who we've come to love. Okay. Uh, good first round, guys. Um, the Really, there's nothing fact-wise to clean up. Um, any like credits you guys referenced was correct. The only thing that I double-checked was... At the start, it was said offhand that Atomic Blonde was a sleeper hit. Yeah, it was it was successful for people who may not realize it was made on a $30 million budget. It made 98.4 at the worldwide box office. Obviously, there's a little bit of extra math to be done there with marketing and theater pullout. But for the most part, it was successful. Um, okay, so in terms of the argument, first off, I think both of you guys did a really, really great job with the pitches. Um, maybe with the exception of the titles, which hard bottom sounds awful. Um, I didn't get I didn't get a chance to work it in. It's the kinetic bombardment yeah, device. You never said why it's called hard yeah. bottom. <laughs> kinetic, I'll, I'll let him ex I'll let him explain it, but yeah. this isn't going to count for the argument. Yeah, it's because it, again, his super weapon is a kinetic bombardment device that shoots tungsten rods to the surface of the earth, and the idea is that if he shoots it at the ocean, it creates tidal waves because it's hitting hard bottom of the ocean. So they keep repeating that phrase a couple said, times in the movie when they bring the up the with a serious face. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He just said I, the word I can see with a serious where you're face. coming from, but hard bottom in my mind came up when you talked about Kevin Hart and Helen Mirren hooking up. Oh yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, no. So in, in terms of pitching, I thought what you guys did really well with both of your pitches. Like these are two of the best pitches I've heard on this show. Both of you looked at this franchise and pulled different elements from the from the Fast and Furious franchise and incorporated those into your movies. Alex, you went with the more extremist side of the franchise, basically saying, fuck reality, let's do whatever the hell we want with these characters, because why not? They've done it before. Um, and Chance, you took more of the like the familial side and the international cultures brought to the film and, and created almost a, like like Alex said in the argument, it, it's a new team of players centered around two old players from the original franchise and created that sort of feel again with with honestly a really well put together cast there um so in terms of the pitches you guys were pretty much equal you both brought some new elements you both pulled the better elements in your opinion from the original franchise and you built something completely uh, whole and new and original and honestly these pitches probably aren't that far off whatever the hell they've come up with for this movie probably not. um oh, they're really no. not so in terms of that the, the arguments were pretty equal so where it came down to me for was the hit backs you had against the other person's plot which there wasn't a lot of but in terms of hitting back which is a part of the argument uh chances points against alex were uh putting kevin hart in possibly could pull from Jason State, the idea of it being a Jason Statham and Dwayne Johnson team up, it, it'll center itself a bit more around Kevin Hart if he's in the movie, which Alec did fight back against saying, well, he's not in the movie as much, but that possibility is still there for when he does show up. And then uh, also the idea of crossing over Armageddon with the Fast and Furious franchise may be just a little too far into crazy for this franchise, though an interesting and intriguing idea, and I'm sure uh, Peter Stromer would love a job. Um, the only thing Alex really had to say against Chance's plot was that it rips off Expendables 3. Um, and other than that, there wasn't a whole bunch of credible hit against it. So because of that, on the slightest of margins, with a great job from both of you, I'm going to give the point to Chance on the first round. All right, that's fair enough. The slightest of margins. But again, I don't think anyone... That's a 50-50 round. Both of you guys did an actually really amazing job pitching those movies. Okay. So, moving on to question number two, and Chance, you're going to be going first with this one. Uh, you do go into this with the one-point lead as of now. Uh, the question is, most wasted character in a major franchise. So, this is, and obviously there were a lot of different angles you could pull this from. Uh, we actually did have an answer given that was denied, so there was some curriculum to how the, the question could be answered. But it's what is the most wasted character 
in a major franchise and chance you're going to go first with your opening arguments and i'll just put out this reminder now just because the first match the first round was a pitch round so obviously it's going to be a little bit longer uh just try to keep the openings and closings as concise as you possibly can and then a reminder because of the first round with chance if you guys do choose to use your minute extension and call it out at this point before the round starts instead of waiting until you're into the round to do it with that being said chance go ahead for your opening Okay, for the for the record, uh, my it was my answer was reject answer was rejected. I said Joe Brody, Brian Cranston from Godzilla, which according to Aaron is not a franchise, but whatever. Uh, so my real pick is uh the Mandarin from the MCU. Now look, Iron Man three, I like the movie. I'm one of the very few people who would defend Iron Man three, but there's something it's in my they do. Personally. Yeah, it is something they do towards the third act, which made people just absolutely just despise this movie and i can't tell them they're wrong so spoiler alert if you have not seen iron man 3 so you should have uh, seen it right now spoiler alert you should have you seen it by now but in case you haven't spoiler alert so what happens in the movie is when you get to about the end of the second act tony stark is going where the man ray is supposedly operating out of he gets there and he realizes that the mandarin that we couldn't know the badass ben kingsley monologuing to the tv it's bullshit He's not real. He's an actor who was hired to play the manor to take the key off the real villain who is actually Guy Pierce. Which, look, there is ignoring there is ignoring source material, and then there is just taking it, ripping it up, and throwing it in the fan's face. Th that is this example. I will get more into it, but yeah, the Mandarin, just the idea, the concept, the character, the, the Mandarin and Iron Man is uh, the MCU in general, hands down, the most wasted character in a franchise, period. Okay, and Alex, go ahead with your opening arguments. All right. Well, in a similar vein, I also went with another <clears throat> with a comic book character, but I went to another sector of the Marvel film universes, the X Men franchise, and one of my favorite comic book characters who I still don't think has ever been done right, Colossus. Here's a character who, for the majority of his film career as a character, has either just been com comic relief, as he was played in Deadpool and appears to be. In what we've seen for Deadpool 2, again, I'm bringing up that movie, I can't wait for it, but, or, you go back to the original trilogy, the Singer and Ratner films, where he's just background fodder. He's just another face in the crowd. He's there. And he's there. And the thing is, you look at the character of Peter Rasputin and his history in the comics, he was one of the second generation X-Men who joined in. He's got an extensive, extensive library of stories about him and, the char and his character being an altruistic hero that really... They've never tried to delve into him, and it's a waste because visually he's amazing as it is, but when you dive into who Peter Rasputin, the man behind the medal is, you've got an amazing character who you could center an entire franchise around himself, and yet all he's doing is being a strong guy in the movies. All right, good opening arguments from both you guys. Once again, five minutes on the clock. Time starts when you guys begin speaking. All right. Well, my okay, thing the problem with Colossus... The with Colossus is the fact that when you have a, a character roster that's as expansive as the X-Men, some characters are just going to get the short strips. And I feel like Colossus, it, it, you're fine not developing that much. Because, like, look, what's... I, I'm surprised you're that big a fan of Colossus. I actually got to be honest with you. Because I don't think, I don't think Daniel Cudmore is that big a fan of Colossus. Mm. Well, here's the thing. Colossus is a character. He was one of the mm. second wave of X-Men introduced to the team back when, in the 70s, Chris Claremont had taken over the book and uh, needed to introduce a whole new roster of characters to flesh out the stories because everyone was getting sick and tired of seeing the same core five X-Men every week in the issues. So his whole backstory is just something phenomenal. He is the descendant of Grigory Rasputin, the Rasputin. His parents were farmers on a community farm. His sister is a powerful magic wielding mutant. His brother was a cosmonaut who died in space. His whole shtick is no, he just wants to protect no, the he's Superman. He's Russian metal Superman. But well, he can't fly or do any of the other cool things that make a difference. Well, here's the thing. He's completely altruistic. He does things to sacrifice himself, if needed, to save the team, all because he doesn't want to fight. He doesn't want to be engaged in combat. He wants peace. He really just wants to settle down and be a farmer and marry Kitty Pride. And at one point, he does actually sacrifice himself to be infected with what's called the legacy virus, which in turn gives them the ability to cure the virus to save mutant kind. Now the thing is with the man yeah, but, all, but, all Man... but all of that cool but all of that cool shit in the comics, they kind of threw that out. Like they made like Claus I never found anything in the comics. He's a Russian guy who can turn to metal, big whoop. In the in the movie they turn him into bland, milk toast, like token white guy who can throw things really far. 
I don't want to spend more time on that guy, especially when he has so many more more interesting characters that we can flesh that we can flesh out in this X Men franchise. Okay, well, to the to your point though about the Mandarin, here's my thing. The thing is, they already had pre set up what the Mandarin was going to be in the MCU when they hinted at him in the very first Iron Man film as being the head of a Middle Eastern and terrorist didn't organization through on that. known to ten. And known they didn't to follow the through on that. They, they, they had the Ten Rings logo. They didn't follow through on that. They kind of those. In doing that, they kind of made the first Iron Man not make sense. Well, the thing is, they didn't want to make a racist caricature. They didn't know how to properly do it at the time, so they kind of went the safe route in casting someone who was playing that character of the Mandarin, a terrorist leader, and then bait and switching us. Honestly, that switch in the third act of the film, it's one of the best bait and switches they've ex executed in one of the films. Ben Kingsley's real true character, Trevor Slattery, is one of the most engaging characters you have in any Marvel film. And I actually kind of appreciate that they did that because it's taking a character who, if you do him one way or another in a certain a little bit too extreme, he's going to become a caricature that people are going to point a target at. Whereas in this version, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a cop out with Guy Pierce being the true villain of the film calling himself the Mandarin. But in the Marvel one-shot, Hail to the King, they revealed that there is another Mandarin out there who okay, wants uh, Trevor Slattery to help. Okay, hold on. What shots, whatever. But here's the that, thing, though. Like, the thing is, but Kevin Feige, that, like, Feige has admitted that that one-shot is canon to the MCU in films. That's the thing. Right. So but, that is still a story they can tell it, down the road if Feige's interested. Not everybody sees the movie. But the, but, the thing, but the thing is, though, like, you could have done that base with a lesser character. The fact that you're doing it, like, imagine if they had a Batman movie where the main, where like the Joker's in it, and like at the third act, you find out that he's a weed smoking band hippie in some guy's basement. Imagine how pissed fans would be. Like that's the same level of doing that to the Mandarin. But yeah, and he, and here's and here's the thing. Like the only like Colossus, he's good in Deadpool. He's more faithful in that movie, but only because like he's not as he's not surrounded by as many interesting characters in that movie. Um. But that's the thing. With Colossus, you have so many great stories involving his character wanting to be a peacekeeper, wanting to use his powers for good. A Colossus story should be that everyone's trying to get him to use his super strength and his steel skin to bust heads and completely be a badass. Those are the type of stories they're telling in the comics. At various points, he's being used as a pawn of other people. Originally, the Russian government wanted to use him as a pawn. There's a point in the comics where he becomes the new host of the Juggernaut. Hell, at one point, he becomes one of the hosts of the Phoenix Force, and every time that happens, they're abusing his abilities and it's working so the fact that peter rasputin the character the man himself has this much unlimited power and yet shows restraint because he wants to be peaceful he wants to protect other people he wants to save the world and just settle down and be a farmer with his, the love of his life kitty pride that's the character i want to see them explore he could be marvel's version but there of are already Superman. like six or seven different super kind of art and they're way more interesting and way more like mainstream than colossus is and plus, Fox is like Fox is like 50-50 on getting their interesting characters right. You want to give them like big Russian metal guy, give, give him a movie? No, like uh, look as far as the Mandarin Marvel, like I feel like you, if you would just like done it done it differently, cast like a great Chinese actor, like cast Chow Yun Fat and Crouch Tiger Hidden Dragon, like he he would have been amazing in a okay, villain so role. Okay, so that is going to be time on the main round. Chance, you're up first for a closing, so go ahead. All right. And I did catch that last point, so you can either continue or move on to something else. I did catch what you were saying. I'll come back to it. All right. Uh, with 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 the Fox X Men franchise, like they're like one of the biggest problems is the fact that they have such a big roster and don't know how to handle everybody. And I feel like as far as characters that need more development and need more time, I don't think Colossus is first on that list. He's like twelfth at best. With the Mandarin, though, like this doing what they do with the Mandarin single-handedly made people hate this movie. I say they fix that villain, they make him a threatening, badass, actually Chinese villain played by Chow Yun-Fat, who I'm gonna go, I'm gonna like pitch till I die. I feel like he could have been one of the greatest, Mar not one of the greatest Marvel villains, one of the greatest superhero villains of all time in a movie. And I think, uh, I think that there's a greater opportunity in doing that character right than giving more time to Russian metal dude. All right, and Alex, go ahead. All right, so 
my whole thing is with Colossus is he's been a background character for most of these movies, but if you give him just a little bit more screen time, you let him flesh out his story a little bit more, talk about where he's come from, the fact that he's a, dis a descendant of Rasputin, he grew up on Soviet-run farming, he has a sister who's an even more powerful mutant than him, and the fact that really at heart he's a pacifist and a peacekeeper, you're making a very interesting character, not just big strong guy with metal skin who throws things far. Whereas with Marvel's MCU portrayal of the Mandarin, that's actually a very interesting take because if you do go one direction or another in it, you keep the fully Middle Eastern terrorist tone or you bring in the original comic version of Chinese billionaire Tony Stark comparison who has alien tech rings that power him and give him abilities, you're going to go either too absurd or too caricature and you're going to offend people. They kind of went down the middle with it and that made sense. And the big bait and switch at the end with the Trevor Slattery character, it's one of the biggest bait and switches in film history and certainly in the modern era. And it works in the context. Also, the fact that, yeah, they've left it out in the wind with a Marvel one shot, which a lot of people have seen that the real Mandarin could still be out there and still used in the future. That's a huge boon for them that they could end up getting the character right down the road as this big shadowy character who eventually comes out of the shadows to fight Iron Man or James Rhodes or Riri Williams, whatever Marvel version of Iron Man they want to go with in the future. Whereas with Colossus, they've just left him in the background so much that if you delve into this character's backstory, you delve into what he's about as a person in the comics, you can make a very interesting movie with Colossus front and center as one of the leading characters and really have people engage with him flesh out what you've done in Deadpool as a standout character, give him a little bit more depth and gravitas and flesh into that backstory, you can make a really interesting movie where Colossus is front and center and really shine, whereas currently he's just been a background player or comic relief and completely wasted by the Fox properties. All right. Uh, yeah, like 20 seconds, that was like a two minute closing. Mm. Once again, another good round, you guys. Um, this one's a little easier for me. Um, I, I think both of you guys gave good defenses as, again, as to why your character could have been used better, but just overall, Alex did a way better job of fighting back against the Mandarin than Chance did against Colossus. He uh, talked about the fact that it could have become a racist caricature. He talked about how well the twist was executed in terms of filmmaking. Uh, ben Kingsley gives a good performance no matter what type of character he's playing. And the fact that they did leave it open to bring back the Mandarin as a way to try and appease fans. Even if it is introduced in a one-shot, it is still canon as he stated. And is probably one of the more seen ones just for that fact alone. Um, he just did a, a way better job of hitting back with different points against the Mandarin than Chance did against Colossus. So because of that, Alex is going to get the point on this round. All right. And with that, we're going to move on to question number three, which is the interesting one here today. Uh, the question is best young adult romance movie. And uh, I want to talk about the history of this question a little bit because it, it, it is funny to me. Um, the original answers submitted were A Walk to Remember versus The Fault in Our Stars. And then uh, Alex found out a technicality in the way of the wording of the question, submitted a different answer that was approved by myself and multiple Movie Battleground admins. And then Chance thought, well, I'll do the same type of thing and submitted an answer. So we have best young adult romance movie with two answers that are not commonly seen as young adult romance movies, but they do both qualify under the wording of the question. So with that said, uh, Alex, you chose to go second on this one, mm -hmm. so Chance, take it away. All right, so yeah, uh, this, that would, the, the first thought would have been interesting, but uh, I entertained my answer. So uh, my answer is say anything. Say Anything uh, came out in 1989, directed by Cameron Crowe. It is directorial debut, and this dude just hit it out of the park. So, this movie pretty much tells the, story, the love story between a uh, you know an average guy who's probably a kickboxer, a kickboxer played by John Cusack, and uh, the high school valedictorian played by I believe Ioni yeah Ioni Sky, and pretty much uh, a really honest coming of age portrayal of young love portrayed in such just realistic just amazing fashion and i can get into it more but i want to you know i'll i'll say that for my arguments all right all right and with that we'll go ahead and move on to alex all right so as aaron mentioned in the preamble when i was analyzing this question i did find a technicality in the wording and 
the answer I actually ended up choosing to go with is Titanic. Let's let's get the pred- pedigree out of the way. 11 Oscars, $2.187 billion, the second highest grossing film of all time worldwide, not adjusted for inflation. But the thing is, this movie at its core is about the romance and the relationship between 17-year-old Rose, played by Kate Winslet, and 19 or 20-year-old, we don't establish it for sure, Jack, played by Leonardo DiCaprio. The romance that in the 90s made a thousand teenage and preteen girls see this movie over and over and over again and made it a billion dollar grossing film. A film that is a technical masterpiece on so many other levels, but if the romance between these two characters isn't there, the film does not work. And two young adults in this film falling in love at first sight and seeing that play out on screen amongst the wreck of the Titanic, makes this one of the greatest movies of all time, like it or not, and is a young adult romance for the ages. All right. And with that, we're going to go ahead and go into the open argument section. Once again, you guys have five minutes on the clock. Time starts when one of you begins speaking. Okay. Well, I mean, mean, you said it it yourself, Alex. I mean, if the romance doesn't work, the film falls apart, and the film falls apart. Titanic is absolute fucking garbage. Like, ser- like, seriously, from every... Well, look, technically, I'll agree. It's great, but that's all it's got. It's got technicality going for it. From a writing standpoint, from a romance standpoint, this movie is absolutely just horrible. And you're right, preteen girls went to see it like seven times in the theater, but you know who hated it, going to this movie a thousand times? Men! Men hated this movie. Say anything could appeal to both to both gender. It can appeal to both males and females. Like, it has that big appeal, that Titanic... Look, no matter how many Oscars you have, it will never have the appeal to boys. Yeah. See, this is the thing, though. Titanic, over the years, did grow an appeal. And men do like Titanic. I, myself, I used to be one of the negative detractors no, of the film. No, you don't. You're a liar. Gro- no, no. Over the years, I've grown to appreciate the film <laughs> and recognizing that it does have a good... It actually does have a good story because it hinges on the romance between Jack and Rose. And it doesn't work unless those two actors, Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio, aren't playing it 100% with their chemistry. And they have that in spades in this movie. It makes them both superstars and the romance but they, don't, Jack but they don't but the problem is they don't feel like they don't feel like people they feel like fairy tale like bullshit fluff characters and that's what that, what to say anything has over that one like say anything oh, These say anything feel like real people you no, know they, people they, like no, they don't. You look at people you, yes, look at do. you look at Say Anything and you have a movie where the valedictorian of high school who's about to go off for a medical fellowship in London falls in love with an army brat kickboxer who happens to be played by John Cusack. That's I have a lot of an absurdist premise. Do an army brat kickboxer, Sarah, so don't you dare insult is, my, my show. It's not, I'm realistic. That is How a, many times have you fallen in love on the Titanic, on the Titanic Alex? Never. I felt, I had to, well, but the thing is, I have fallen in love at first sight, just like Jack and Rose did. My fiance and I fell in love on our very first date, and it's a romance you like Titanic. That it. can happen in real life. And the thing is, that film was so rewatchable because of the romance between Jack and Rose. You have to acknowledge the okay. fact that. Okay, in but here's, 90s, but here's, here's the thing with your movie. It's like it's like the way it's written and the way it's directed and the way these two actors are acting. Like it's completely, it's believable. Like you're completely torn apart when these two break up, and you're like you're rooting for them to get back together by the end, and that's why that's what good romances do. They make you root for these characters. Jack and Rose, I don't give a fuck about those people. I was I was rooting for them to die on Titanic because I hated watching them for three hours. Oh, by the way, yeah, that's another thing. Three hours. Yeah. And an hour and a half of that in the movie is spent on the romance between Jack and Rose and digging into it and seeing how these two fall in love. So much so that you had teenage and preteen girls going to see this movie five, six, seven, eight times legitimately. I had classmates in junior high school who really admitted they really, they really, talk, they really talk about like who they are as people. Like they really just they're really just like teenagers that want to bang. Like, they're, they're horny teenagers. That's about it. Yeah. And as far as your Oscar argument, as far as your Oscar argument, best as that as far as best picture, best picture is not the end all be all. Five no, it's of the top not. ten movies on the AFI Top 100 list do not have Best Picture. Titanic is often considered one of the worst movies to win Best Picture. And if Oscars matter, Suicide Squad is one of the best movie, well, best comic movies of all time. And that's the thing not is, true. I'm not. I'm not arguing the Oscar merit of the film. I'm arguing the fact that the romance between Jack and Rose is the crux of the film. If that doesn't work, the film doesn't work, and people wouldn't have wanted to watch it multiple times, like, which they ended because up because doing. Because it's written so poorly. And look, 14, 14 Oscar nominations, not one not one nomination for Best Screenplay, because it's written like shit. These characters are completely one. One big...
Sorry, I was saying, uh, it, like the writing is horrible. It makes these characters completely one-dimensional because, and it makes the romance completely just fall apart. Okay. Well, the thing is, though, the writing aside, it still comes down to the performance of Jack and of Jack and Rose and their actors, and they play it with a hundred percent certain certainty that these two are characters who are really falling in love with each other. The scenes they have, the "I'll never let go" scene, the "Draw me like one of your French girls" scene, for God's sakes, the the heat between them, the chemistry between them is there, and it's there like in that. space. Whereas with talks like that. Whereas with Lloyd and Diane, sorry, I had to look at my sheet to remember her name because it's that forgettable. I can't remember a line of dialogue the two of them have together. The only scene anyone remembers from that movie is the boombox scene with Peter Gabriel, which has been ripped off so many times. Which that is better than any of- scene. It better than any single solitary scene in Titanic. Oh, the scene where they're on the bow of the ship and she holds her up like and makes her feel like yeah, she's flying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Like at the, because, scene where, because, the thing. The boombox scene was full, was fueled by real emotion because it was written by a guy who actually understands young love, as opposed to James Cameron, who clearly does not. Well, that's the thing though. It then comes down to the performance of the two actors, and you watch Leo and Kate and their chemistry in the film and their performances one hundred percent commit them oh, as sky just young and people are falling in love. They have out of the water, like. Seriously, and because because they give him more to work with, they give him more like better things to work with. Opposed to Leonardo and Cat, Leonardo and Cat wins the two on, fine. That's gonna be time on the main round. Chance you open first, so you're gonna go ahead and start with closings. All right. Sure. Titanic, two billion dollars, eleven Oscars. Oscars are not the end all be all, and if box office were a measure of films' merit, Transformers Four would be one of the best films of all time. So that doesn't matter. What it comes down to is the quality of the film, and the quality of the film is just not good. And look, a lot of it hinges on the romance, and that romance falls completely fat, flat. 14 Oscar nominations, not one for best screenplay. You know why? Because this is written horribly. Jack and Rose are completely one-dimensional characters. Their dialogue is fucking awful, and it makes the romance just completely fall the fuck apart, as opposed to say anything, where it's written with a complete understanding of what makes young love, what makes that special, and what makes that, and what, like, all the emotions you have to go you go through when you're going through something like that. That's what that's what makes this film work. John Cusack and Ani Sky are amazing together, and what makes and they're they're fleshed out. They're real characters. They're real people. You know people like their characters in the movie, and I think that's what makes this a way better romance movie and a way better movie in general than Titanic. Okay, and Alex, go ahead for closing. All right. Well, my closing will. Honestly, just go back to the point of say anything as much as it has pedigree and who's in it with Cameron Crowe's first feature film and John Cusack's breakout role. They're not remembered for this film. This film actually becomes forgettable. It's a product of the time of the 1980s. Crowe would go on to do way better romance movies, Jerry Maguire. Cusack would go on to do way better romance movies, High fidelity. Ioni Sky would go on to do basically nothing after this film. She kind of petered around on TV and in films a little bit and small roles and bits and pieces. The most memorable scene of the film is the boombox scene, which has been ripped off to death in so many other forms of media that it's lost all meaning from its impact from the original picture. Whereas with Titanic, yeah, you bring up the box office, you bring up the Oscars pedigree. The film would have none of that if it didn't have impact on the audience at the time. And that impact is the story between Jack and Rose, their romance, the chemistry between Kate and Leo. If that didn't work, that movie would not have been the juggernaut that it was. And their chemistry and their romance is what makes that film great and rewatchable still to this day. It made it rewatchable at the time. It's still rewatchable now for the right audience who are in the mood to watch that kind of movie. I myself, Hey, I might want to rewatch it. I actually think I might rewatch it in a couple of days when I have the time to sit down and watch it, just because I not only want to see the wreck of the Titanic again, but I want to see that chemistry between Kate and Leo because they did it so well in the movie that you actually do believe these two people could fall in love at first sight and carry out a romance in a tragedy. Two billion dollars because teenage girls are impressionable morons. Oh, it sorry, works. I had to get that. All right. All right, good, good, good arguments, guys. Um, <clears throat> uh, just to run through some quick fact checks. Uh, obviously, Titanic is the second highest grossing film of all time. It made two point one eight seven billion dollars on a two hundred million dollar budget. In terms of Oscar nominations in nineteen ninety eight, it won eleven Oscars for best visual effects, best sound editing, best sound mixing, best original song, 
best original dramatic score, best film editing, best costume design, best cinematography, best art direction, best director, and best picture. It was nominated but did not win for best makeup, best supporting actress, and best actress. It did not receive a screenplay nomination. However, it was nominated for best original screenplay by the Golden Globes. Count that for what you wanted. It was also, however, nominated for best original screenplay that year by the SAG Awards. Um, the screen, or sorry, yeah, the sorry, the um, WGA, the Writers Guild. That's what it was. It was oh yeah, for, like that's not possible. No, no, yeah, it was nominated for best screenplay by the Writers Guild Awards. Uh, other quick random fact checks, uh, James Cameron's experience, what love was called into account. He's actually very experienced at love. He's been married five times. Married uh, three times. His, his most recent wife uh, is Susie Amis, who he married in 2000, so he obviously eventually found one to be happy with. Uh, also, he was previously married to Linda Hamilton and Catherine Bigelow, if you didn't know that. And uh, the other fact check was uh, Ioni Sky. I'd never heard of her before today. She did not do anything with her career afterwards. Her most recent film appearance was in the Netflix movie XOXO, and before that, an uncredited appearance in Zodiac. So, yeah, she's I'm doing... Uh, anyways, uh, this one, again, was a little bit easier for me. Uh, kind of the theme of this match is the the defenses are, are kind of on par with each other. It's just a matter of who gets more out beating down the other movie. And Chance went on a fucking beatdown against Titanic in that fight. He got way, way more out and way more credible stuff out than I think Alex did again say anything. Alex's only real points were that it's not, it, the plot is very conventional. It's something that would only happen within a movie and that it's not memorable and it really didn't make any of the people in it stars the way that Titanic did. But other than that, Chance talked about the romance feeling played out, the fact that it was only good on a technical level, which the Oscars do prove. He talked about the uh, the romance, again, feeling very contrived and forced, the excessive runtime, the bad writing on a part of the characters and the dialogue. He just brought way more in terms of pitting down the movie and the fight. So for that, Chance is going to get the point on the third question and go up two to one. Let me just say thank you for choosing that. Uh, I've been waiting to tear Titanic apart for you. Yes, damn it. All right, guys, and with that, we are going to get into the fourth and final question of the main game. The score is currently one to two, so we will be heading to the speed round no matter which way this goes. Uh, and the question that we are asking is uh, best in, in honor of the release of Gringo, best movie starring Charlize Theron. And Alex, you chose to go first on this yeah. one, so go ahead with your opening arguments. Also, before we begin, just because we're on the final question and neither of you have used it, did either of you want to use your minute extension or just keep this one to five minutes? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, and five minutes it is. Alex, go ahead with your opening right. arguments. So, when I want to think of a good movie starring Charlize Theron... I have to go back to the movie that made her the big household name she's become in Hollywood, and that is 2003's Monster, directed by Patty Jenkins. This is a movie where she does a true-to-life story portraying multiple murderer Eileen Warnos in a role where she transforms herself, and both mentally and physically portrays Wernos in a very, very scarily accurate way. It was her way of stamping open the door in Hollywood and saying, I'm not just another pretty face. I can act. I can go method if I need to. I'm here. I'm a star. Deal with it. And Hollywood responded by seeing this movie, seeing her commitment to the character of Warnos, and the film crafted around this portrayal of a very, very interesting character along the lines of Hannibal Lecter or the Joker, but who just happens to be a real person, and giving that seal of approval to Charlize because of this film to make her a big breakout Hollywood star for years to come because of her performance in this film and how well the film was made centered around her great performance. All right, and Chance, go ahead with your opening arguments. Was it best performance or best movie? Best movie starring Charlize Theron. But performance is obviously a part of that. Okay. Of course. No, I was making sure I had the question. Okay. I pick it's interesting because I read this on one of my very first episodes of the Battleground. Uh, Post apocalyptic car chase action masterpiece uh like what can i say about this it has already been said it does so much with just like stunny and um like visual, i could say uh not to mention you have a scene stealing like movie stealing performance from charlie throwing at the center of it 
it may as well have been called Furiosa, Furiosa Road featuring Mad Max. Like, he portrays so much in the movie. She has so many levels to go off of, and I can but I want to save them for the actual match. So. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and get into the main game. You guys have five minutes on the clock when one of you begins speaking. Okay, here's the thing. With Mad Max Fury Road, yes, Charlize Theron is kind of the highlight of the movie. When the movie came out, everyone was talking about her performance as Furiosa as a big feminist icon. The problem is, though, she doesn't really do much in the movie. She's there just basically... Oh, my, that is a lie. She drives the rage. She had all the cool acting sequences. He ends up beating the evil was... dictator in the movie. She yeah. does plenty. Here's the thing, though. Yes, she's a big action crux of the movie, but as a character, she's not really doing much. Uh, everything that's interesting about her is what they explain in her backstory. Otherwise, she goes from completely wooden and stoic to completely over the top at points with no middle ground at any various no, point. No, fair. Like, they, they, never really, they never really have a moment where they explain her story. To... Then it comes through her acting. Like, she has to who, like, she's done horrible things in the past and has had horrible things done to her. And I think that's okay. what she, like, yeah, she plays a great famous icon. There's a reason for that. She's one of the greatest female protagonist ever in a movie and as far as monster goes yeah like, i can't i can't deny it. she's fantastic in that movie but like that's the only thing that movie has going for it the movie it's fine like oh no and the movie monster. as a whole it's one great performance nothing in that nothing in that movie is as good as, as charlie's the Rome. well no monster has also a great performance by christina ricci playing her lover and her compatriot in some of the murders that she committed it's a character study into eileen warnos I mean, sure. a woman who was sexually but, and that, but that's but that's all it is it's just, it's just a character study the movie Movie as a whole, it's it's it, it's fine. Like well, that's, that's the thing. Okay. You, Whereas Mad Max Fury Road, it's it's a summer block, it's a summer blockbuster. Mad Max Fury is a summer blockbuster that transcends the action genre and transcends the genre of post-apocalyptic movie itself. Well, that's the thing. Mad Max, honestly, as a movie, you go back now and I and rewatch it. It honestly is just all visual style. There's really no substance to the film. This is a film that very notoriously was made with no. That's actually, that's actually that's based also on not true. Story that is also not true. Visual. Well, it's like, whatever they, George they Miller wanted to sure, they, don't, they don't like what they do is they don't lay out the story like clean cut, clear here what it is. What they do is they give you enough information that you can piece it together yourself. They give you enough so you can connect the dots. Well, that's the thing, though. You all, With Monster, you also get that kind of story with her portrayal of Eileen Warnos and the fact that she goes from being just a prostitute to a multiple mass murderer for a reason. It portrays an LGBTQ romance between her and Christina Ricci that is believable. It's not something over the top like and over sexualized. We have seen yeah. a ton of movies like that. We've yeah, never when seen it's anything over the top like that in your road. Yeah, but you... What I'm saying is you would you would have seen that kind of romance, but over the top and overly sexualized. Here it's real, it's gritty, it's something that you can sink your teeth into. Not to mention they portray domestic I the violence same, I the and same sexual thing in by the Wachowskis. Yeah, which was overly sexualized and way too over the no, top. No, that was not overly sexualized. Realistically. This film is treated realistically. Not to mention her portrayal of Warnos. She digs right in. She gained 30 pounds for the role, shaved her eyebrows, wore a prosthesis, to the, got so method in reading up about Eileen Warnos, seeing tapes of her, hearing tapes of her, that she became but, Eileen but, Warnos. But the problem with Monster is they also kind of try to make Warnos a little likable, which is kind of disrespectful to the people who actually were actually victims of Warnos' crime, which... Yeah, that that's not that's not very good. Like they kind of they kind of cop out of the end just with like real realistically. Uh, yeah, because they try. Uh, they have Max, to make at the end of the day think, they have to as, make a film as a whole. As a whole, the film it, the film is better. Transcend just being a summer blockbuster action movie. The fact where it was even nominated for ten Oscars, including Best Picture, a summer blockbuster post apocalyptic action movie that was the fourth entry in the franchise that started in 1979 was nominated for Best Picture. Like that move that that's an incredible feat for a movie like this. Yeah, but at the same time, you go back and rewatch it and you can see that it's ultimately just visual spectacle. There's no substance to the film. There's no meat to the film. You watch it once or twice and then you don't need to see it again. With Monster, there's layers built in oh, by Patty that, Jenkins like, and the storytelling. Gonna go down, it's going to go down as a classic, whereas Monster, yeah, it's a great biopic, but we've seen like great biopics yeah. like and 60 it's a forgotten. times. And it's a forgotten biopic, which you can go, which go, you go back and you watch. This is made by Patty Jenkins, the same woman who made but Wonder that's the thing. And that's, that's the thing. The thing. What, Monster is forgotten. You will never forget Mad Max Fury Road. It's one of the most unique cinema experience ever put to film. And if you watch Monster, you'll never forget Monster because of how well made a movie it was by Patty Jenkins, how well directed it was, how well it written it was, it gets, and the it performance of Charlize so Theron. There's so many movies like it. Like, but Monster doesn't do anything special except for a great performance at the center, and that is it. That's all it has going for it. 
No, Patty Jenkins does visual things in this movie with camera takes and camera movement that just set up scenes. It's shot nice? That's what you're trying to say? You want to compare the cinematography? One of the cinematography to Monster versus Mad Max Fury Road. Mad Max Fury Road, they have so many things they have to capture. It's so many like sweeping vistas. Most so of many great done. shots of awesome action sequences. Yeah, most of, of which are practically by, by the digital, way. Most of which is enhanced by digital effects and created in a computer. The background, where, the backgrounds were enhanced by digital. The backgrounds were enhanced by digital effects. The cars and the stunts were not, and that's what I think is like so sweeping myself. But I got that by Charlie yeah. Theron. Well, the problem is that okay, this movie came with that, out of, that is actually time on the round. Alex, you went first, so you're going to go first for closings. All right. Monster is a movie that people have kind of forgotten about over the years. But if you go back and you watch it, Patty Jenkins made a very effective thriller film that happens to be true to life. Yeah, it does take liberty cinematically with the story of Eileen Wuornos and how she became a mass murderer. But the fact is, it does things in the era which were just unheard of. It's a film directed by a female director that was very critically acclaimed and was nominated for several awards in its filmmaking. And you go down to Charlize's performance in the film. Yeah, it's the centerpiece of the movie, but it's the centerpiece of the movie for a reason. She goes so deep. She goes method into playing Eileen Warnos to the point where people who knew Warnos in real life at points were mystified by how well she was doing in the role that they thought they were watching Eileen come back to life. The film cruxes on her performance and she crushes it. And because of her performance, it's a rewatchable movie where, yeah, you have a character who, like Heath Ledger's Joker or Hannibal Lecter, you, you, at points, you're so engaged and enthralled by them that you may want to start rooting for them, but you don't because you know they're a despicable, horrible person. And, and ultimately, it's still the best movie featuring her because she is the standout of the film. She transcends what the film would be otherwise, where any other actress who gives it half the commitment she does would make just a serviceable movie. It's her commitment to the character of Warnos that makes this a standout film and the best film she's ever been a part of. Okay, and Chance, go ahead with closings. Okay, yes, Charlize Theron is great in Monster. There's a reason she's one of the best, the best actress for that one. I can't deny that's a good, that's a great performance. But that's all the movie has going for it. And you even said it yourself. People forget about Monster. People will never forget about Mad Max Fury Road. Like it's one of the most unique movies ever crafted. And to think it was done like yeah, yours was done by my mom. Mine was done by a 70 year old man doing an R rated action movie in the summer of 2015. Like it's in, it's incredible. It transcends the genre. Th Charlize Theron. Is an absolutely sensitive performance, and she's one of she's gonna go down as one of the greatest uh, female heroes in cinematic history. And I think what sets this over the movie as a whole is better. It has great writing, it has great acting, great direction, great performances. Despite the fact that yes, these actors are not getting much to work, but what they do is they craft stories that you can follow. Despite the fact that they're not being spelled out for you, you can tell so much about who these characters are, what they've been through, especially Furiosa despite the fact that she's not really talking about much about her backstory. She conveys everything through her just like emotion and action and like her facial expressions, which I think is way better. It's way harder to craft a story around your character when you're not given one. And I think that's why this is the best movie overall starring Charlize Theron because this movie's firing on cylinders, on all cylinders from start to finish. And it holds you in and never lets you go. And I think it's gonna go down as a cinematic classic in, tw in 20, 30 years. Okay, uh, great argument, guys. Once again, uh, the first thing for fact-checking, and I, I always do this when we're talking about best movie just because it's the easiest way to kind of talk about general opinions on a film, and I always preface this, Rotten Tomatoes is not the end-all, be-all when it comes to critic reviews. It's just a it good not. aggregator to get an idea of what something, uh, what the general opinion on something is. Uh, in terms of Monster, Monster has an 81% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Mad Max Fury Road has a 97% fresh rating on on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, the other quick one that I looked up was uh, Monster was compared to the Wachowski, Wachowski sisters' first film, Bound, which had a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, and then Academy Award success was also talked about for the films. Monster was nominated for one Academy Award. It was Best Actress, and Charlize Theron did win. Uh, Mad Max Fury Road was nominated for, I believe the number was uh, 10 Academy Awards. 10. It was 10, yeah. 10. It won for Best Sound Editing, Best Sound Mixing, Best Makeup and Hairstyling, Best Costume Design, and Best Production Design, and was nominated for Best Visual Effects, Best Cinematography, Best Director, and Best Picture. Um, 
so in terms of arguments, once again, you guys were really, really close. This was this was a really good match, not just because it's like two guys who work together fighting, but you guys are both too, easily two of the best fighters we have. This was really, really good. Um, a lot of your points were really, really, were really, really close. Um, but in the end, I'm going to give the point to Chance on this one because... He Alex did mention other aspects of the filmmaking, but a lot of it was focused on Theron's Th or Charlize Theron's performance. Whereas Chance did talk more about the outside filmmaking within Fury Road, and he also did kind of use one of Alex's points against him, where Alex brought up the fact that the movie is kind of forgotten over time, but that makes it even better when you go back and discover it and realize how great it is. And Chance can, can easily counter with the fact that, yes, but it is forgotten in a way, which does make it inferior to Fury Road, which is a harder-to-forget movie for any. So even though personally I disagree with Chance on this one, it is going to the point is going to go to Chance, um, which means we enter the speed round with Chance up one to three. Three to one, but yeah. Three to one. You know, yeah. the numbers were correct. It, you know, you guys know how this works. Uh, all right, guys. So with a score of three to one in Chance's favor, we're going to go ahead and move into the speed round. The way that this works is the first two questions are going to have a time limit of 30 seconds and 15 seconds. Um, the question will be read to the players. The first person to answer is going to go first on that question. Um, if the score comes out to a 3-3 three, three tie and we go to the final question, they're going to have three chances to talk at 30, 20, and 15 seconds. Do you guys have any questions? Nope. All right, like I said, the first person to four points is the winner, which means Chance has to take a single question in the speed round to win. Alex, you're going to have to pull all three of these out in order to take the victory today. All right. So, all right, here we go. The first speed round question is, what is the most exciting location we might see in Avengers Infinity War? Wakanda. All right, Chance answers first with Wakanda. Hmm, this is a good one. Um, I will say I destroy – it's kind of hard to say. Ugh. What are you trying to get at? Maybe I can help you like, get the yeah, – Yeah, I can give you some help. Yeah, they're bad when, – whenever they actually go into space to fight. Okay, so just so just space. Basically, yeah. Okay, that that that's fair. We'll okay. we'll, we'll count that. So it's gonna be uh, Wakanda versus the the outer space setting for the final battle, which is what again what we're assuming. We're working off assumptions here. Uh, all right, Chance, you're gonna be up first with thirty seconds on the clock. Time starts when you begin speaking. We already Wakanda was and how it off Black Panther, which was great. But I think what's really exciting is all these whole new characters. We're gonna see Captain America from Wakanda. We're gonna get to see Iron Man. We're gonna get to see so many with this cool, lush, Afro futuristic scene done in um in uh, Black Panther. And I think because like they're setting the stage for like Wakanda's gonna be a huge player in this movie. And I think it's gonna see you know what aspects we haven't Time. seen in that culture yet and what they're still hiding. Time. All right, Alex, I'll give you an extra two seconds because you went just a little bit over there. Right. Time starts when we begin speaking. Well, Chance just pointed it out. We've already seen Wakanda and Black Panther, and we've seen an epic battle in Wakanda. We're just revisiting an er a scene we've already been. But the idea of the Avengers going into space, seeing Iron Man with a new suit fighting in space, seeing the new Spider-Tech suit in space, seeing the Guardians fight alongside the Avengers against Thanos and his soldiers in a space setting and a broken asteroid fulfilling that dream scene we've seen from tony stark in avengers age of ultron that's a scene that we've been wanting to see and it's something exciting because we see the forecast that the avengers will fall to the hand of thanos and i want to see how that plays right. out all right chance 15 seconds on the clock and you begin speaking We've also already seen space. We've seen it in Avengers, seen it in the, both Guardians movies. The, the point is how are, how are new characters going to interact in new space? And I'm more excited to see. I think it's going to be way interesting to see the, the, than it is in space because, like, it's just going it to be them in a ship Time. or, like, in suits outside. But, like, they're, they're interacting with whole new characters, Time. whole societies. Time. All right. 
Alex, I'm going to go ahead and give you 20 seconds because you did do, go a little over on that one. So, Alex, 20 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. The fact that we're going to see more of the Avengers characters in Wakanda doesn't distract from the fact that we've already seen a battle in Wakanda, and it's basically just different characters playing out the same scene. The fact that we're going into space with characters you normally wouldn't associate with space, such as Spider-Man and I and Captain America, potentially, is an exciting fact. And the fact that we're fulfilling a scene that was so menacing in Age of Ultron. Time. All right. Uh, both of you kind of repeated your points on the second round of that one. There wasn't a whole lot of rebuttal, so I'm going off of your opening 30 seconds for both. Chance basically pitched the idea of we get to see characters that we haven't seen before in Wakanda. We get to go back to the setting that we enjoyed in Black Panther. Alex pitched the idea more of we've already seen Wakanda in the films. We know what we're going to get just with the different characters. Space is something we haven't seen before. He pitched the idea that we're going to see all these different characters and new different looks in a new setting. Uh, fulfilling what previous movies have said. I'm going to give the point to Alex on that point alone, the fact that it's a new setting with the characters, new combinations, and it fulfills what Age of Ultron set up. All right, second speed round question. Who should play the Joker in the upcoming solo film besides Joaquin Phoenix? <laughs> ben Barnes. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to go with Will Poulter. All right. Two probably un more unconventional choices from what people would say. We have Ben Barnes versus Will Poulter. Chance, once again, you answered first, so it's going to be 30 seconds on the clock for you when, time when you begin speaking. When Ben Barnes was what people... I thought it was going to be like some teen idol, but in recent years in shows like uh, The Punisher and Westworld, he's proven that he can go He can go in different levels. Like The dude is menacing. He's got the great physique. He's got the acting ability. Like you see on The Punisher, he's threatening. He is an amazing villain. And I feel like he can bring that same kind of energy and that same kind of gravitas to a role. Like he's a younger dude who's going to be a kind of... Origin movie, which I still think, think is stupid, but we need someone right. a little young on the younger side. I feel like Ben Barnes looks enough right. like Jared Leto so that he can. Right. All right, Alex, I'm going to give you 35 seconds because he did go a little over there. Time starts when you begin speaking. I picked Will Poulter because Will Poulter was this close to playing Pennywise the Clown, and to me, that is a sign that he has the ability to play a menacing clown character, not to mention his filmography in, as both comedy and drama roles kind of leads you to the point that he can play that character who can play both sides and be on the edge. And you're mentioning Ben Barnes because he looks like a young Jared Leto. I want to forget about Jared Leto. I don't want that Joker to exist. So a character, another version of him that would remind me of Jared Leto is not one that I want to see. Whereas Will Poulter, he brings both a comedic and dramatic side to the table. He's not your typical Hollywood action star, your good-looking star, but he brings acting gravitas to the role, and Fine. he can really sell it. All right, Chance, 15 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. I did not bring up Ben Barnes, he's a young Jared Leto. I brought him up because it's a plus, but and he's a great actor. But what probably Will Poulter is, I feel like will happen with happen with Pennywise and like and all that. He's kind of franchise poison. I feel like he wants to get away from that and do smaller movies. And I feel like putting him in this role, it's not it's not gonna do Fine. anything for him as an actor. I feel like Fine. he's a lot of All right, I'll give you a couple extra seconds, Alex, because he did go over again time stretch when you begin speaking. Will Poulter walked away from the role of Pennywise because he didn't actually agree with the direction that the machetes were going to take the story in, but he still wanted to be part of the film. And the fact is he can still bring that kind of energy of Pennywise as a menacing character into the role of the Joker. Whereas with Ben Barnes, he's more of a, he is kind of following the mold of a Hollywood good looking Time. kid who then takes edgy roles. Okay. And another good round there. Um, I think I'm going to give that one to Alex again. I think both of you went for the idea of, like, like you both gave good pitches as to why they can fit. Um, 
Alex brought out though the fact that he has precedence in both drama and comedy, so that could be uh, adding to the role. And then he also kind of talked about how you know Ben Barnes maybe just kind of fitting in with the pretty boy role, which I think Chance did do a good job at disputing with earlier points in the round. Uh, but Alex took that one just a little bit extra for me, so I'm going to give the point to him. Based on what he almost did. Uh, whatever. All right. So that means uh, the score is 3-3. Three, three. It does come down to the final question here. And you guys are going to have 30 seconds on the clock to answer this question. Um, this is kind of – this is uh, pick, pick the better option. Um, I have a question, and I have two answers that are relating to that question. This is – just so you know, in terms, I haven't said it yet, obviously, but in terms of the, the question, this is just going based off in terms of general reception with the question and the answers I picked. Uh, obviously, if you have a personal disagreement with whether you think the movie is worse than what the question is stating or better, I'm just going based off of general reception with the question, okay? Okay. Okay. The question is, what is the better of these two disappointing sequels? Avengers Age of Ultron or Star Wars The Last Jedi? Last Jedi. Last Jedi. All right. Alex did get it first, so Chance is going to have Age of Ultron. All right. So like I said, you guys are going to get three chances to speak on this one. It's going to go uh, 30 and then 20 and then 10. Uh, Alex, you are the first to go this time. Time starts when you begin speaking. The detractions against The Last Jedi are basically just fans who cannot admit the fact that the Star Wars franchise needs to grow and change and take a story in the new in new directions, which it failed to do in The Force Awakens. It's the one problem with that film. With Age of Ultron, it is disappointing for a reason. It scraps so much potential that the second phase of the MCU had built up to that point by just shoehorning in Ultron and making him a one-film villain, having Vision just show up part near the third act of the movie for really no logical reason other than just a couple of plot points that are brought up throughout the film. Film. With The Last Jedi, you have Ryan Johnson taking right. the story. All right, Chance, 30 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. When talking about it, the fact that it's just, uh, it's just the same as the last one. At a certain point, when we take a step forward, because of the deeper movie, delve deeper into the characters, you get a deep gang of the Hulk and Hawkeye, which are two characters who get Post the last Jedi, fucking hate, and I can't say I honestly forget. They waste a lot of plot thread. They do a lot of things that kind of go against what they set up in the original trilogy. And there's really there's no consistency. It kind of turn people on. People don't know if they want another one anymore. Time. All right, second time round to speak. Alex, you're up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Twenty seconds. The thing with The Last Jedi is it sets up, it does not fulfill expectations from the first film because it's not beholding itself to the canon of the original franchise and its previous film. It's trying to take the story in new directions and grow the franchise with its new characters. Whereas with Age of Ultron, they try to set up new things for characters we've seen in the original in the previous film, but they still waste it by giving them little screen time. All right. And chance 20 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. There's a, diff there's a difference between not fulfilling expectation and completely going off the rails. Like, the except completely just dismiss in uh, The Last Jedi, which that's just that's just a bad franchise building move right there. And as opposed to Age of Ultron, you get more time with Hawkeye, who was completely useless in the first movie, and you actually get more into his character. Vision, great addition, and actually really makes sense time. with the story and with comic lore. Time. All right. Alex, you get an extra second there because he went just a little bit over. Time starts when you begin. For the, for the record, for the record, I'm stopping when you're saying why are my connection works. You, you keep hearing me after. Okay, that that's fair then. All right, ten seconds. Okay. Wait, ten or fifteen? Ten. It's ten seconds for the final one. It's ten. Okay. Oh. 
Ultimately, the problem with Age of Ultron is it tries to introduce too much new to the franchise and flesh out characters that don't really need fleshing out, whereas with The Last Jedi, it's trying to introduce new things to the franchise and take the story in a new direction. All right, Chance, 10 seconds on the clock. So, so I'm trying I'm, I'm... Last, last Jedi takes Star Wars the stupid direction to turn on the franchise. Avengers of Ultron. It adds to the characters, which adds to the tension the situation. So when people die, it feels, it feels more. You feel more for these characters. Right. You feel more for what the situation. Okay. All right. Good round. Good round for both of you. Um. Okay, so in terms of supporting the movie, both of you guys kind of had the, the same type of deal, which which I would agree with in that both of the movies were expanding on what the previous one set up. Both movies are taking characters and expanding on them. With Chance specifically, you did talk about the fact that it pulled characters we did not focus on in the previous movie, like Hulk and Hawkeye, and gave them an expansion in Age of Ultron. Um... So in terms of that, you guys were were pretty equal on that uh, throughout the whole sixty seconds. Um, I think in terms of the the hitbacks. It's close. I'm trying to re like replay everything in my head. It's really, really close. I think I'm going to give the slight edge to Alex, though. I I just think, and I think maybe it's because it plays into the fact that he got the choice that he wanted, but I think it was a little better organized in what he was saying. Again, it's really, really close because a lot of you guys, you were making kind of the same points about what you were saying about each film, which I think is fair. There's a lot of points on both ends you can make about both movies. I just think whatever it was, the way that Alex presented it and what, what he was saying in terms of specifics, I think worked a little bit better. So I'm going to give him the point on that one, which means Alex does win the match with a four to three score. Um, oh, the first thing that I have to say, because I know there's obviously going to be a surprise and disappointment is. And I've said this before, this was easily one of the best matches. I've never had a harder time actually trying to judge every single round. Like, I think the easiest round may have been the Titanic one, and that's just because Chance had a clear beatdown on that movie. Um, but at, at seven out of seven rounds in this were so close every single time. It came down to minute little details and points on who won what. So I want to say no matter... No matter who won or who lost today, um, you guys have both proved with this match that you are two of the best fighters that we have. Uh, I hope to see you both back in the future, obviously. But th this was th th this was one of the hard. This is this was harder than the title match, honestly. This was really really close, um, and that was a hard match to judge. And it's I feel like I'm going to get shit for this one the same way that I did for the title match because e every round was a call where you can make one or two points and, and turn it the other way. But this was close. Um, first off, we'll, we'll go to, um, we'll go to chance. Um, chance. This was a really, really close match today. Um, obviously after playing for this long, it, it probably doesn't feel great to not come out with the victory, but how are you feeling after that? 
Uh, uh, because of, look, I, I swear, as soon as you said that, that my connection sucks, I didn't get the choice I wanted, and it shows that I got burned for that, so it fucking sucks. Yeah, I, I, yeah, we can hear you. I, that's the only rough thing about, about doing this online is sometimes the connection can play a little part in the game. I will account for on my end. I, I wasn't even thinking about that during the speed round, so I will account there is some human error on my end of that, of giving Alex a little extra seconds here or there. Um, so I, I do apologize for that. I, I just wasn't even thinking that about the internet issues at the time, delayed dialogue. Um, but it was really, really close. Obviously, you know, you have a really, really solid record. You're in our top 10. You're one of the best players that we have. We'd love to have you back in the future. Uh, post-tournament, is there anybody that you'd want to take on and play? Okay, look. Uh, anybody I want to take on? Uh, I say line up, line him up. I'm going to knock him down, Aaron, because I am fucking pissed, and I'm and I, and I not going to get mine. So you know what? At the tournament's over, bring him out. Definitely. Um. I feel like the ultimate motivator is putting myself up against people I've pissed off. So maybe I'll just put myself against you and give you another W because um, it, it worked for Jeremy. Um, with that, we'll go to Alex. Alex, you pulled out the victory today. Um, the first thing that I want to say is you have actually set a record today, um, unless I'm incorrect, but I, I don't believe I am because we've made jokes about it in the videos. Uh, you are the first player to ever enter a speed round one to three and come out with the victory. Uh, the closest we've had is, I think, um, the only one I can remember off the top of my head was Chris Clark pulled out two, but then ended up losing, and I know that that's happened before. But we've never had, excuse that, if you heard that, um, we've never had anybody pull out the victory in a speed round. Um, so what do you have to say to that? And then just overall thoughts on the match. Uh I'm fucking speechless. Like I am shaking. My heart is racing. I'm, I have something in my throat. Like, oh my god. Like, yeah, connections played an issue, and yeah, maybe I was afforded a couple extra seconds because of lag and mishearing the time and things. But at the same time, like you just said, it. I the first person to come back being down one to three, going into the speed round and winning the match. What the fuck is with me and my battleground career doing shit like this? Oh my god. Like this this was a fight. Like this was a battle. Like, I knew going into it this was not going to be another knockout victory opportunity. This was going to be a scratch and claw and I had to scratch and claw. But holy crap. And now I know who I potentially have to go up against in the next round and that's going to be even worse. So and I'm gonna have to be on my A game. With with that point, we'll uh, we'll we'll go on and talk about that real fast. So uh, this is the first match of round two to go up. You are the first person to move on into the third round, and your opponent is going to be the winner of Jeremy Adams versus Manning Franks. Um, obviously, both are are good players who have had some good matches. Um, the question that I'll ask you that I've asked everybody who is in the same position is who do you think is going to win that match and who would you rather see? The answer to both is Jeremy. I think Jeremy is going to win that match. He's proven it time and time again that he is one of the very best and is champion material. And I want to play him because I want that challenge. I want that head-to-head -head matchup against my friend, just like I had here today. A match where I know there's no personal issues going on behind the scenes. It's two people who are on an equal level and two very different fighters. I'm very analytical. Jeremy's very passionate. That is that going is to true. be something spectacular if it happens. I'm not saying for sure he's going to beat Manning because Manning is a great player. If you haven't, go back and watch Manning's match against Madi in round one. That was an amazing match. But the potential of me versus Jeremy... I would I would even say Manning's loss against Jen was still something really well that, done. He put up a fight. And that too. But I want Jeremy. I, I want to play Jeremy. I want that test. I want to prove that I am a championship caliber player. All right, and uh, with that, guys, uh, I can already see 
the controversy, which I am waiting for, because apparently I'm the only judge that can bring that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Chance had to drop out a little early to go do uh, set up for something for Full Metal. So, Alex, I'm going to hope you know his plugs. Where can people find him at on Twitter and social media? Uh, Chance Wars 93 on Twitter. I know he's on Instagram under Chance Ellison. And, of course... Check him out on Full Metal Media and Full Metal Trivia here on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, same with me, Full Metal Media. Again, I will pump it till the day I die because we built this together and we are growing it together alongside you guys on Battleground as part of the Worldwide Movie Games Network. And for me, I'm going to try to be a bit more active on social media. Uh, we'll announce because it's probably going to be announced before this video. Check out Full Metal Media on both Instagram well, and Twitter. This, goes up. this match goes up on march 17th oh yeah there'll be plenty of time so check us out on check out full metal media on facebook and youtube check us out also now on instagram and twitter we're definitely going to have the links across our facebook page and of course subscribe to the worldwide movie games network home of us movie battleground and there will be trivia this tournament season has been awesome we have a championship coming up in full metal at that is going to be something really special and coinciding with the two tournaments going on it's going to be can't miss programming Definitely. And with that, uh, you guys can find me on Instagram at Aaron T. Canole. That's the only social media that I have. Um, as Alex said, it um, to first off start with Movie Battleground. If you guys are not a part of the Movie Battleground Facebook page, um, join it. It's the only way you guys can, if you're not a part of the page, you guys can't be involved and learn about the matches and how you can get involved. Uh, I'm actually going to be starting to look at getting the setups going for post-tournament matches. So it'll certainly be interesting to see how we can make that work and who we can fit in. And we want to fit... Uh, obviously, you know, we have people that have played before and we're going to work on bringing them back and getting them some more matches, but we want to get the new people in here as well. And the only way you can do that is if you're a part of the Facebook page. Uh, if you guys are not a part of the Worldwide uh, Worldwide Movie Games Facebook page, join that. It's the um, it's the way you can get all the information for all the different shows going on in that channel. We have stuff going up uh, almost every day. Something's uploading, whether it's Full Metal Trivia, whether it's Movie Battleground every Wednesdays and Saturdays, whether it's There Will Be Trivia. Uh, we have stuff going up every single day. All of us are involved with every single aspect of this channel, and we're doing everything we can to try and bring the best content. Uh, and the joke I, I made it in the Jeremy match, and I'll make it again, uh, definitely support Full Metal Trivia. Uh, the stuff that those guys are doing is really amazing. They're really taking... Uh, they're taking the the trivia game and they're doing something interesting with the format and they're doing stuff really cool. Uh, and their videos are not movie length. So you can definitely enjoy them way more than you can enjoy this stuff um, unless you like sitting through movies about people arguing about movies. Um, with that being said, guys, as well as supporting all the different pages, all the different groups, uh, be sure to follow and support all the different admins for Movie Battleground, Evan DeGraff, Jeremy Hastings, Linus Babcock, Matt Beer, Sue Rath Charma, and Robert Parker. All of them put a lot of hard work into doing this as well. Guys, we will see you in the next video of this tournament. Uh, Alex will obviously see you against either Jeremy or Manning. Either match will certainly be an entertaining fight. Ah. My name has been... My, yeah, that describes everything about this night. My name is Aaron Canole, guys. Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you next time on the Movie Battleground. Take care.